Almost two years into the pandemic, with disruption now part of everyday life, leaders have some new items on the agenda as they strive to not only survive, but grow their businesses. Globally, customer experience is recognized as the new battleground with employee experience getting some long overdue attention. Meanwhile, digital transformation is escalating before our eyes. I'm Leandro Perez, Vice President of Marketing for Salesforce Asia Pacific, and I'm excited to be hosting the Salesforce Executive Conversation Series where we talk to Salesforce global executives on their thoughts, perspectives, and experience working with thought leaders in the C-suite across the globe. We've had so many incredible conversations so far. If you've missed an episode, you can catch up at sfdc.co forward slash conversations. Today, I'm talking with someone who's been described as a superstar analyst, Michael Mose. He's a CRM, CX, and CEM expert all the C's. He's got a history of firsts, having been a member of the first global CRM software company. He was one of the founders of Gartner's CRM practice and launched their first annual CRM summit. He has also lived and worked in technology on three continents during his career. So it was inevitable that a dedicated change maker would one day join us at Salesforce, where he is now SVP of Innovation Strategy. Welcome, Michael. Hey, thanks for having me today. <laughs> Look, we're just going to kick off just with a few icebreakers, if that's okay, Michael. I'm just going to ask you some questions for all the folks tuning in to get to know you a little bit better before we get into the meat and potatoes, basically. Is that okay? Go for it. So where did you shine at school, like going all the way back to when little Michael was growing up? You know, where, where, were, you, where were you shining? Well, it's going to be hard to believe, but it was geography. I was like a great cartographer. I made maps of my own imaginary world. That's incredible. And did that lead to when you were around that age, I guess when you were 10 or so, thinking about what you would be in the future? Were you going to be Indiana Jones or something? Where, where were you heading with this? I actually had a name for myself. I called myself Banyan. I don't know, kind of a Banyan tree in India. I didn't know where India was, but it sounded great. But no, what I wanted to be was an oceanographer. You know, in, in the day, Jacques Cousteau, he was so great with his French accent and, you know, he was all, got all around the world and saving the planet. And uh, I, that's what I wanted to be. I love that. A little Jack Cousteau, I love that. So if now fast forwarding a little bit and you know, you've got many colleagues around the world, how would they describe you in a few words? First word they'd probably say is enigmatic. Uh, second they would say is uh, brusque. And third they'd probably say honest. Okay, I love that. I love that. And for the folks maybe that aren't in the industry and heard the bio but you know, aren't quite sure what some of those words mean, how would you describe what you do every day uh, to someone that is new to the industry? Yeah, my job here at Salesforce is to look out at technology trends and social trends and find when it comes to customer engagement, what is that going to mean in terms of products and services that we need to produce so that our customers will be able to do this job of connecting with customers better than anyone. All right, well, let's get stuck into some of the questions. Mike. I know we've got a lot of great content planned for our audience here. So let's kick things off. You know, the, the pandemic keeps evolving, giving us new strains, lockdowns, border closures, and the, the dominant effect that happens with that. So with your expert CRM hat on, tell us, you know, what you're seeing emerging out of all of this. The first thing I would say we're seeing is an acceleration of virtual. And of course, virtual has been around for thousands of years since we started trading, not uh, in like time, you get a barrel of oil and I get wheat but we started going over to currency. So now we're seeing things like cryptocurrency since the pandemic started, it's up 500% and non-fungible tokens and uh, kids playing Roblox and Facebook renaming itself and Zoom and we're spending all day and then Slack. So an acceleration of the virtual. And I'd say the second thing is that we are seeing that this crisis, like every crisis that's come before it, is unleashing a lot of innovation. Crises are great for that because you now have the opportunity to try things that maybe you couldn't do before. It's because of the exigencies of the moment. When it comes to consumers or businesses, what they're really looking for during this crisis is more authenticity. They're really looking for us to come and show our more genuine selves. And another thing I'm seeing on the consumer side is a rise of a, of a new group that they're really believing in, that they're trusting in, and that is, they've been there for a while, of course, but it's been accelerated. 
and the new influencers being the guys of actors in musicians in uh, athletes. So this idea of turning to them, and we see a lot of businesses then relying on these kind of people like, like the athletes, like the musicians as spokespersons because they wanna get trust. And another, I'd say the last thing I would really see happening with an accelerated is a new generation, let's call them Gen Z. But it began with the millennials who are asking very different questions and it's accelerated during the pandemic. And we think it, it began before, but it's going to continue out through it. And that is, they're not only asking about your product, they're asking about you as a business. They're asking, are you ethical? They're asking, what about your process on sustainability, on inclusion, on diversity? These are things that go way beyond what we probably would have seen in the past. And, and yet this kind of rolls up into a new definition of trust. Look, now, when we've talked before, you've mentioned something around the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. And uh, tell us how that applies here in, in the thinking, the opening you've had here. Yeah, of course, that's a, a movie from about 20 years ago where one of the uh, stars of it uh, erases her memory to forget a relationship she's had. Now, more and more customers are saying, hey, you're putting in first multi-channel and now you're saying you're going omni-channel. And that's all well and good as I do some self-service and I go to your, your, your portal, your website, or I use your mobile app. But the problem with that is I've been forgotten. So in the same way that you and I if I were to meet you tomorrow and I said, gee, I don't, I don't recall. We, we did a recording together once. Uh, you would say, well, gee, what's wrong with this person that they don't have that memory? But when it comes to corporations, sure, they have put in the bot and they have put an email and they have put an SMS and they do have the website and they do have the in-store perhaps experience. But when you go from one to the other, there's no continuity in that experience. And that what that does is it creates friction in me trusting you. Friction is really the enemy of trust, and trust is the central core of loyalty. So, the, of course, the message is, let's do those things to increase trust, to keep that continuous dialogue, and by definition, you will raise loyalty. I love that you have this concept of continuity because it is very true. Like if you had a, a personal relationship, you would hope that people would remember the last time you, you came together. Hopefully if they've invited you to their house, they've served you a meal. But that is true that in businesses, it's getting harder as you have so many channels now to do this. What are the challenges with having this continuity that you talk about? Obviously, most businesses would want to have that and they're trying to put in some pieces in place. But where, where are the roadblocks there for achieving that Nirvana state? Yeah, uh, let's, let's take a look at every business. Really, we all experience it as consumers, but also as business people, we experience it with our business partners. And that is that we kind of export our org structure in the sense that as a customer, I have to go to billing and billing is over here and selling was over here and the marketing people are, who knows, they're pervasive. And then when it comes to customer service, and let's say the majority of the engagement I'm going to have you with you over time is not the salesperson or the sales site or the sales bot. It's going to be with that ongoing, I need support, I need service. But when you, let's say, create all those silos, now how do I, when I go from one to another, now that's just the department, but I've also on top of that, each department, sales, marketing, logistics, billing, tech support, they have all of their own individual channels. So the idea of having this joined up conversation becomes remarkably difficult. Just do the math on it. I, I think the, the permutations there are getting increasingly harder as you grow as a company, right? And I think everyone, it sounds like everyone's trying to do the right thing within their department, but it's really that uniting all those teams together that's the missing link. And, and then having some of the, the systems, the processes in place so that the, those things can talk to each other is, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, and that's what it is. And of course, I can use AI, I can use integration, I can use BI to determine what is the best channel. But then when things get complicated, let's think about that. What AI can do is simply analyze very, very large scales of data. But the minute something becomes symbolic in nature, it's complex. Something broken, I don't know what to do about it. Um, the flight has been delayed or the trip has been canceled or the border has been closed or I found a better price over here from another company. Now I'd like to have a human. And when I want to have that human, I don't want to feel it was begrudging. I don't want to feel I had to wait a day or two 
in the case of airlines and hotels, hours trying to get someone to support me. When I do have that human, what people are looking for, especially now in a time of prolonged isolation, they want something that is exceptionally rare. And that's an extraordinary experience with a human agent. I love that concept of the ex extraordinary experience because that's what you will remember. You won't remember that you kicked off the process. You'll remember how it was handled and hopefully with a positive or a delightful outcome. So let's continue on. I, I do have an interest here in the surface experience. Um, are, are we being novel enough in that area? I think obviously giving an extraordinary experience is something we talk about a lot. We've been talking about a lot. Have we innovated it enough, this area of customer experience? Well, to date, if you look at most companies and, and all companies pretty much, uh, though there are exceptions that I, I've spoken to where they don't have a notion of the agent is limited in time or they're limited in the scope of their autonomy to make decisions. But generally speaking, the focus has been, and, and rightly so, on the baseline is to reduce costs. We want to use technology to reduce costs. And so we want to press out of the system everything that really is a binary. It's a question that has an answer. It's the service is going to be restored here or it's going to be restored there. But they haven't really thought about the impact of a great customer service experience that would then allow for upsell or cross sell. Uh, so for example, we work with a really wonderful company in the uh, alarm and home protection area where it used to take a lot of time to just take an agent find the right technician. That agent's on the phone, they're looking at someone's schedule, they're trying to get them out there. And what they did, they used automation to within minutes, literally, um, down to seconds, literally, to find the right technician, the right date that fit your period of time. And what they did was with that saved time was do upselling and cross-selling because they had the technology, they had the algorithms, they found the technician, now the customer's like, that's fantastic. And let me tell you, if you go to the house to put in these cameras, many people like you have put in the alarm system or people have upgraded to this, that, or whatever. So they're actually using the technology to change the service experience from just a uh, cost center where you lower costs into really a place where you market and sell. That is, uh, I guess, a fundamental shift we've seen in, in leading organizations that have, have and it's, it's a simple thought, really. It's just convert that experience and the ability to make money for the business. But it's not always so easy. What, what is, why would some companies struggle in doing that? Where is, the, where is the problem there? Well, if you look at any organization, where does customer service sit? And that kind of shows what their extent of power is going to be. So sales and marketing have extraordinary budgets. If you think about it, most organizations, probably 40, 50% of all dollars are, are spent on sales and marketing. And of course, they're looked at as the growth engines. If you look at the C-suite and what the CEO, what he, she, or they thinks about customer service, they might even have very little contact with them. In fact, we saw a uh, survey of 11,000 companies in the United States, these are all B2B, when they were asked what is your differentiator? What do you think your differentiator is? Most of them were back 30 years. They said it's the quality of our product, or it's the price, or it's the power of our sales team, or it's our marketing. When in fact, they looked at that as 80%, the surveys of their customer base, this is business to business, said that 70% of why they chose this company over that company was the service experience, and it was how they helped them set up, keep to the brand promise. Nothing to do with quality and price because they assume that. That's all public information. Everyone knows quality is almost a bar that if you can't get over it, you're not in business. But service, that still remains a key differentiator. But there's very little awareness high up in the C-suite of just how critical this is. Pretty mind-blowing stats when you think about it. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're not leaning into something like that, 70, 80%, these are very high percentages. So going back to where you opened with, which was, you know, authenticity of experience, you know, actually the acceleration of technology leading to all of this, it's, it's incredible the opportunity that we have. I guess the, the challenge, the further challenge where we opened with is that we're in a pandemic. So how does all this get complicated by people working from home? Maybe not all the time, but potentially more than they used to. Yeah, well, I, I like to start with a, a positive because the pandemic and the work from home, that has had some really, really strong positives for us. And that is that we, if we do have a work from home capability, and I wanna caveat that because 
we jump on the bandwagon of work is a thing you do, not a place you go. But the fact is we have to sit back and remember and, and be really mindful of the fact that 60% of the people in the workforce don't have that luxury. They're in hospitality, they're healthcare, they're frontline workers, they're police, they're fire, they're in airlines, they are providing food, delivering. That's 60% of the world economy. It's the 40%, I would say, the, it's where they have the luxury, as you and I have, of working from home. We, so I have to put that back and really be mindful of that all the time. But when we do look at that population, we've had the great resignation. In the United States, a month ago, 4% of all workers quit. That's an unprecedented number. You might have 1%, 1.5%, less than 1%. And people are saying, I want to restart. I want to rethink my priorities. I want to rethink the, the job I have. And now I can source people from anywhere. And so we're seeing I'm not limited to Sydney or Montreal or San Francisco. I can get them from anywhere, and that's really provided a boost. Now, the other side of that is when you have prolonged work from home, we see that there are issues around morale. I've forgotten what the corporate uh, ethos is. I'm, I'm not there in person. No one's seeing me. I have about a third of our colleagues who I've never met because they, they joined our company after the pandemic began. So the idea that they understand me, they trust me, that they feel that they're going to be promoted, that they feel there's going to be uh, equality. Also, in interest, they left mental health. How do we deal with the wellness issue, not just the physical wellness, but the fact that in any given household, and this is Asia, Europe, US, South America, 60% and more say that someone in their household is suffering from anxiety or depression, and that has catapulted since the pandemic. And so it behooves us now to step up all of those things that reinforce not only the, the tools and not only the knowledge of the processes, but also the overall wellness of, of the employee. And we get that right and we have a loyal experience for the, for the employee. When you take loyal employee with loyal customer, you suddenly have a brand new thing, which is real success. So let's unpack a few of the things you mentioned there. So firstly, I, I would acknowledge the 60% that don't have the ability to, to, to work from home, um, especially in service industries. How do we help them? Is, is AI, data and analytics the answer to helping some of their roles? Or is that purely only for the 40% the that do have the opportunity to, to work from anywhere? If you look at the pivot that we've taken before and after the pandemic, the idea that a, a grocery chain would suddenly move to contactless shopping and pickup was just extraordinary. I, I know because we had so many customers in that industry who just said, no, that's, that's something that will happen down the road. But now they have it. The idea of dynamic scheduling so that people can know very, very optimally how many people to put out into the field. The idea of baking in scheduling and protocol and vaccine protocols building all that into the system. And we know that every person goes there will be safe. So the same thing with that 60%, putting those procedures in place to have them in the field when they need to be in the field and to make sure that they're, they're safely at all time and to do everything we can for contactless and all the protocols around con contactless, that has really made, been a game changer for that 60%. And then now flipping to the, the folks that are working from anywhere, you talked a lot about morale, ethos, wellness. Wow, the one third I think uh, is probably pretty common around the, the world, which is folks that have been hired during the pandemic. What can we do? How do we help as leaders to be able to, to accelerate that and make sure that those folks are looked after during this time? Yeah, uh, we've all gotten Zoomed out, Right, so we're, we're a little bit tired of these uh, Zoom calls, but we are seeing a partial return. Uh, many companies are now saying, you know, we'll go one day a week or two days a week into the office. We're also seeing managers do a whole lot more in outreach, and they're doing it on a weekly basis, a couple times a month. They're checking in to see, is the employee feeling strong? Are they feeling connected? Do they have a sense that they are being recognized, being rewarded the way that they expected to be. 
we're also seeing offsites. So maybe I can't bring everybody back into the office, but perhaps I can do an offsite. And there we're doing the morale, we're going through our vision, we're going through our values, we're going through the methods that we need, the obstacles in our way, and how we're gonna be measured. We're doing those things maybe back in the office, and then we go back to our, our home office. And that hybrid of working, where we do many things in the office, as I just mentioned, and the rest from home, that is really helping to close the gap. I'm seeing a few connections between what you say there for employees and as well as for the customer in terms of extraordinary experiences. The offsite is the kind of extraordinary experience when people get to come together, reconnect, as well as a customer service experience. Do you see some parallels there? Is, are there similarities in how we should think about that? Well, what we're seeing in terms of the customer is something that, uh, that's why I go back to my, my whole idea of authenticity and doing things that are exceptional because they're really wanting you to step up. I'm at home now, and when I'm at home, I have a lot more time to compare. I'm comparing brands. Uh, I'm looking to see, digging really down into who you are as a corporation. So the, the parallel to, to that is, yes, we have to, if I look at how Airbnb, for example, we all know Airbnb, when the pandemic hit, they suffered tremendously. But what they did was help their, call them their sellers, the property owners, with how do I let consumers know that this is a safe place to come to, that we are taking care of them? So I think the converse is that we're, we are working in a, a very, very elevated fashion. When I say we, all of us around the world, and think about airlines, think about hotels, think about manufacturers, think about everyone out there, all of the messaging that says, we are doing everything in our power to keep you safe, and not only that, we're putting the tools in place to show that there, there is really some, some force behind that arrow. You've mentioned a few industries there. So airlines, you know, Airbnb, obviously hospitality, talk about manufacturing. Are there some industries that are doing better at customer experience and some of these wellness issues that we talk about for the employee as well? Yeah, well, what we, when we see issues overall about innovation, it, it tends to be in the consumer first. And the business to business world really is a fast follower from the consumer world. And the reason is that the competition for anything is so much accelerated. If you think about almost anything, your hotel experience or the kind of clothes you, you wear, anything around that, there, there's a dozen different ways that you could get that for yourself. And what we're finding is that companies are using a lot more business intelligence and a lot better use of data to understand what moves the customer. So the, the customer might say that, what I wanna do is I wanna be on brand. And this idea is very intriguing when you say on brand. What they're saying is that you, car company, or you travel company, or you retailer, the products you sell and the brand that you build are not that much of interest to me on their own, but they are interest to me and how I develop my brand. So the idea we have that the, the brand is the business, the brand really is the consumer. And so the reason that we see business to business fast following the consumer world is because the competition for that, understanding the customer, introducing the technologies to really close that, that like last centimeter, that last millimeter between you and the consumer, uh, requires so much exactitude, so much data and ever-changing data that then we see that come into the business world, but we really see it in the, in the retail consumer world. So I, I love you know, many of the responses you've given here, Michael. Would you like to wrap up for us now with some final direct advice for our leaders, anything practical for what the opportunity is, how they can get started? Yeah, and I think that most of this is really practical if you think about what we've been talking about. And I think it could be wrapped up by saying, really you wanna do things in collaboration with the customer. The idea that the customer is almost an afterthought I mean, we go to our leaders in sales and marketing and service, e-commerce, and we ask them, we do surveys, we I do some, some uh, very basic things on the outside, but really making the customer at the center. Uh, we have a framework that was created by uh, Professor Clay Christensen, the late Clay Christensen, was called Jobs to be Done. And we're a big believer in Jobs to be Done. Jobs to be Done means, why did the customer hire you in the first place? What exactly? do they want you to do? 
So Peter Drucker famously said that the customer never buys what you sell. It's a very mysterious sounding thing until you really think about jobs to be done. You're selling a product and service, but the customer is consuming an experience. They buy you because you, the experience that they get is aligned with who they are as a person or as another business. So the idea is go outside and do this in a hybrid way. Work with the customer, bring together IT, who is of course responsible for all the technological advances, have them work with the lines of business and have the lines of business bring in the customer so you really can wrap this in a bow. You have the outside in perspective, you understand the jobs to be done. You have the business leaders working with the technology specialists. And the next part of that is make sure you measure. Measure, 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 because oftentimes we launch into these initiatives, we put in technologies, and what you're really doing is automating a bad process so that it runs even faster, for which you get bad results even faster. So I would say that that's a really important thing to do. The other thing is to remember not to confuse complexity with lack of ease. So there are many, many cases where complexity is your friend. If you think about relationships, if you have a very shallow relationship with the company, it's transactional na nature. If it's just transactional, I can leave you, go to someplace else. But if I can make it a little more complex, if I can integrate my partner ecosystem so that the, the change that would be required to leave me, it's not just moving from buying a pair of sneakers from here to over there but it's the running club or the cycling club. It's the clothing that was tied in. It was the events that were wrapped around it. And you see in the business to business world, that's happening. Whole ecosystems forming, for example, around Salesforce service ecosystem. Our, our ecosystem revenue is larger than our, our own revenue by, by many, many times. So the idea of, yes, complexity can work in your favor and you will be rewarded as long as you make it easy. Make every step logical and intuitive. And then the last piece I'd say is make sure that what you deliver is highly differentiated. Because in a world where I have 10 choices or 12 choices, I have to really understand why did I go and choose you? What is so special about you? And again, it's not the quality and it's probably not the price. There's something that you have to understand in me is what, it, this thing is what resonates really. It's your level of service, it's your sustainability, it's your ethos as a company, all things being the same, that's what I did. But you have to capture those things, understand each one of your, let's say the generations that, that engages with you, what moves them and right down to an individual level. So differentiating, re reducing the, the the choice to the right choice for me as a customer. Uh, and then as I said, remember complexity can really, really uh, be your friend and to wrap all the way back to the beginning of our talk, make sure there's a wow factor, do something provocative, do something I'm gonna remember, do something, uh, a random act of kindness as uh, one company famously calls it, that wow, you really made a difference in my life, the experience, the product, the service, set you above the rest. And then you will have customers, loyal customers, growing customers for life. Wow, Michael, I think you laid out the playbook there for successful businesses. I'm just gonna summarize a few of the things I heard. So the focus on the customer, which of course here at Salesforce, we, we have that as a mantra, but it is so important. The measurement of that, which is in, obviously if you're, if, you're not under, you know, if you're not understanding how things are working or not working, you're, ne you're never gonna go where you need to go. I love that concept also of simplicity, but having a complicated, not a complicated, but a, a, an in involved and involved relationship with your customer, because that means that you are differentiated to your point. And finally, something that's near and dear to my heart in marketing is that wow experience. How will that exceptional service be remembered? Thanks, Michael. Now, we don't know what the future holds with borders and closures, but hopefully we'll be able to have you in our region very soon. Yeah, I can't wait. And I just want to express my gratitude to all of our clients and all of my colleagues out there. And just remember the curve of forgetfulness, which says if you don't go out and do something with this information within 48 hours, 60% is going to be lost. So go do something. Thank you, Michael. And folks, you heard it here first. Let's go and take that advice up. Thanks again. Some really incredible conversations we're having in this series. If you want to learn more about these topics or watch more episodes, visit sfdc.co forward slash conversations. So far, we've covered, amongst other things, customer loyalty as the new currency, 
inclusivity and collaboration in our new world, effective decision making, and today we've had another riveting take on how to deliver extraordinary customer experiences. Thank you for tuning in to our executive conversations. See you next time. Oh, I'm supposed to be recording this? Is it, did you hit okay. stop? Oh no. <laughs> Sometimes we get some funny bloopers in here. T oh, t touch up, Michael. Sorry. You don't have this on your side, but you can watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm beyond being touched up. Apparently, I'm uh, shiny or something, right, Bing? <laughs> You're a mess. You're just a mess. I'm a mess. <laughs>